I'm Estelle Bingham, and this is the Love Purpose Connection podcast. Here on Love Purpose Connection, I want to explore how to discover and really develop the secrets of a good life. I'm a holistic therapist and healer, and so over this series, I'll be sharing frank, inspiring, sometimes raw, often joyful conversations with a different guest each time, exploring just what those three words really mean, but also crucially, how you can discover and develop them in your own life. Today I'm talking to Pilates Rehabilitation Specialist, Reiki Master and Coach, Tulsi Vajiani. Tulsi is also a plane crash survivor. When she was just 10 years old, she lost her mother, her father and her brother in that crash. She survived, but she sustained second and third degree burns to much of her face and body. In the years afterwards, she endured bullying and low self-worth, which led to compulsive behaviours and eating patterns. And then at the age of 26, she also suffered from severe kidney failure. When I first read Tulsi's story, I was deeply moved by the unimaginable challenges she's faced, but also by her commitment to her own inner journey, which has really helped her find profound self-confidence, self-acceptance, and a real understanding of the true nature of non-attachment. Tulsi, welcome to the Love Purpose Connection podcast. Hi, Estelle. (laughs) Hi, I'm so pleased that I'm here with you because I found you on Instagram and your story and it was so inspiring to me. You're a survivor of a plane crash. I am. It's not often you get to say that, right? It's not often that you get to say that. And of course, the way that your life has evolved, where you've moved from that experience to something so healed, this place of real wholeness, you've gone on this really amazing spiritual journey and you just embody so much of what Love Purpose Connection for me is about. And is it is actually, if you think of that, just that phrase, it, it does feel like embodiment, doesn't it? It feels like a wholesome feeling. So Tulsi, for the people who are listening and who, who don't know you, can you tell us what happened to you at 10 years old? You're in India and you are getting on a plane yeah uh, so age 10 uh, sort of in the last year of my primary school just before I'm going to start secondary high school my parents sort of decided they're going to give us a life experience opportunity which maybe we might not get in later in life so my dad wanted us to experience life outside of the UK outside of London you know where poverty exists and, and you know all of those things as well as cultural richness So we went to visit my great granddad in India. Well, my parents both decided, let's travel the south of India. So we got on the plane to go to Bangalore, which is another city in the south of India. And then I remember fighting with my brother because he got to sit by the window. And I wanted to sit there because for the first time, we like seeing, you know, blue skies and green fields, which is not what we get to see here in the UK. And the next thing I hear is my grandmother's voice telling me, that I've been involved in a plane crash and that my mum, dad and my brother Kamlesh are no more and that I look different. Now, that didn't make sense because here I'm fighting with my brother and then she's telling me I look different and they don't exist. That's kind of what was going on for me. Then the next kind of voice I hear is a young medic's voice who's kind of, again, reassuring me, you know, it's also don't worry, you're going to be okay. I'm taking care of you. All the doctors are at the um, airfield site. You're going to be okay. I have no recollection of time. It's just in and out of sedation. That's all I know. Flown back to the UK and transported to Billericay in Essex, uh, St Andrews Burns and Plastic Unit. There I met with my other family members, like aunts, uncles and cousins. And again, the information they're relaying to me is literally the same as what my grand said. But it doesn't make sense because... I'm still fighting with my brother. As far as I know, I'm on the plane. And when they say you look different, I mean, what does looking different even mean? Like, I haven't changed my hair color. Nothing else has happened. So how can I look different? Four to six weeks post-accident, they're going to remove the bandages from my eyes now because between that time, I've just been in and out of theater, skin grafts, plastic surgery, 
being treated for smoke inhalation. You know, so all of that's been going on. They removed the bandages from my eyes. And of course, it's one of those, would you like to see yourself in the mirror? And I'm, you know, I was excited because of course I do. Because internally, I was just still saucy, you know, boisterous, loud, jovial. That's who I was. And then see that mirror held in front and it's like, oh, that's not me. I mean, who drew this face on? Because that's not me. And I literally thought it was a joke that somebody stuck this face on the mirror. But when that person was moving their mouth and their eyes, it's when I realized that's me. So I now look down at my left hand, you know, heavily scarred. It was red raw. I had metal rods sticking out the fingers to straighten them. Either naively or optimistically, it was kind of, in a year's time, there's going to be this cloth. It's all going to go away. This is not a big deal. And that was kind of me up to that age anyway. That was always been me. You know, I'm very much, I'll just get on with it. So in hospital, you know, as you can imagine, everyone just treats me as me. I was nothing unique because obviously in the burns and plastic unit that's what you're going to get people who with burns my family again just tried to keep everything as normal as possible so when I've left hospital and been discharged for me it's just the world's going to be just the same you know like it's fine everyone's just gonna see Dulce as Dulce not somebody with burns but it's then when life has changed where you know the name calling the bullying uh, people crossing the road in case they caught something, uh, children throwing things at me to see what kind of reactions I would give. And that's when I realized that one, I was different. And two, my confidence and esteem didn't exist anymore. Like it literally went minus, you know, from someone who was really confident, very self assured in that I've got this, you know, like I can do anything to now going, I can't. So let's just kind of go back to this part where you're in a profound shock and in your mind, in that that child's mind, you are actually on a plane with your brother and you get back to England and there is suddenly this huge abyss, you know, or this, this huge gap where mum, dad and brother are no longer in your life. They're no longer here. How did you feel into that at the at the time I think for me it was denial and you know uh, the five stages of grief was literally that and then it was very much convincing myself they've lost their passport they're trying to get back to the UK um, maybe they've got no one out there so they don't know how to come back so I've kind of told myself all these stories but the mere mention of their name or even looking at an image of them I didn't want to do that so I kind of wanted to pretend they didn't exist. So for a long time, I just couldn't acknowledge them. I couldn't talk about them, mention their name. I couldn't even look at pictures of them. So where some family members were trying to hold on to memories, I didn't want to be part of it. There were times when I wanted to rip pictures up as if they don't exist. I'm glad I didn't because imagine I'd have no memory left. I mean, no physical pictures, but that's what I wanted to do. What did you do with that loneliness? Um, just focused on my rehabilitation because, you know, I was in and out of hospital a lot. So even after I was discharged, I was literally going in every day for physiotherapy, dressing changes. So a lot of that just continued. So I think where my focus was always on that, it's almost like I didn't have time to be lonely. I also kept myself busy. So a lot of times with my cousins, a lot of times with family coming over and I made really good friends at school. So again, it was like hanging out with them a little bit more and even summer holidays or stuff, you know, like I always had cousins here. So again, like I was always active, but I think it's moments when I was getting bullied. Initially I would share it with somebody, but they would just be like, Oh no T it's okay. You know, just ignore it. But it's not just ignore it. Right. It's, it's something that's happening to me. So I couldn't really turn to anyone. So I start internalizing it. And as I kept internalizing it, I kept eating. So my outlet was eating. So comfort eating, obviously. So you started emotional eating. Yeah. Food was easy because, I mean, you know, coming from an Indian background, food is in abundance. It's everywhere. Like if I went supermarket shopping, like with my grandparents, 
you know, I'd put like extra crisp in the trolley or whatever. And then I'd sneak that upstairs. And it, it was like a running joke that I was like a mouse in the house that just would pick up food. But the severity of that was, it's not one or two packs. I'd finish like a 12 pack in one sitting. And every time I felt like, say today I'd experienced some form of bullying, I'd go home and eat until I couldn't think of that or hear that in my head. You were numbing the experience with food. Food equals love. You know, it's that, it's the sort of twofold relationship. Absolutely. For me, crisp was my connection to my mum. I've always known that. So for example, before the accident, I wanted to eat crisp in the morning. I wanted to eat junk food in the morning. And I used to fight with her and she'd put it right at the top shelf. And it's like, I can still get it. You know, I'd be really rebellious. So my connection with my mum was crisp. So obviously I just kept holding on to that. So Chris became my addiction. And even till not so long ago, I mean, when I say not so long ago, about seven, eight years now, I could make a meal out of it. So if I travel around the world and I didn't want to eat anything else, as long as I had Chris, I was fine. So again, it was holding on to some sort of comfort. It's like a comfort blanket. And then around the age of 15, I sort of started to have these other friends outside of school where drugs were around, as in... Yes, it was cannabis, it was fun, it was jokes, it was getting high, it was doing something rebellious. And then it was around age 16, 17, it was cocaine and heroin. But none of it was long lasting. Like I wasn't addicted, if that makes sense. In respect, I tried it, did it a few times, but there was a thing inside me that I still needed answers. These things weren't giving me answers. So this is a waste of time now. So I started just smoking regular cigarettes, thinking I'm rebellious and wow, look at me. But again, it didn't do anything for me. And then alcohol starts coming in because now it's like, you know, the party scenes and friends are doing it. I don't want to be the odd one out to say no. And then on the alcohol side, again, never knowing when enough is enough. I'd be the girl with two, three glasses in her hand every every situation. Like it was something really cool. So again, drinking to suppress. Uh, taking drugs to suppress. It was all suppressants because coming from a sort of Indian background, we don't share our feelings. We don't cry. There's nothing wrong with us. Life happens. Get over it. It's That's very much the gist of it. And then I start to suppress the fact that I never really needed parental loving because if they're not here, what's the point of requiring something that I don't have? So I used to watch families and kind of wish... I had that, but it was kind of like, oh, stop wishing for something you can't have. Just get over it. So everything was always about just get over it, you know. Um, So, yeah, so the food, the alcohol, it just got more and more. And then at the peak, as I like to call it, at the peak of my depression, I was at a size 22, 24 UK size. Yes, I know the weight was going on because obviously the clothes were getting tighter and I was buying bigger clothes. but internally I didn't feel big and that's how I got through it. So a combination of being disassociated, really not in the body and also on the run, not being in in a loving place with self. And so this journey to back to a sort of deep self-love and a sort of embodying of who you are and a true expression of who you are, when did that begin? Yeah, so my self-love journey is actually quite new. So I had this thing called fake confidence. So again, going out, you would never have guessed that I was going through internal turmoil of feeling not good enough or low self-esteem. You just would not be able to guess, even from my pictures now, you know. Like I said, life and soul of the party, all of that. People know who I was. I was Miss Popular. All of that, you know, attention I was getting. But the actual real essence of it came to fusion in about 2013. So just before that, my kidneys failed at the age of 26. So 16 years after the accident, I have another big trauma. Doing my second degree, like really enjoying it, really thriving in it. Just finally finding something that I love. And then now I'm being ill and then getting diagnosed with end-stage renal failure. Literally all I heard was you're dying, even though no one said that, that's how I felt. It was like another wake up reminder that you're still alive. What are you doing? 
And then it was not until I had my transplant, which was in 2009, my kidney transplant, that there was one night in the ward. You know, it's kind of eerie anyway, because all you hear are machines going off or someone crying in pain. I was on quite a heavy dose of steroids. So, of course, that's quite hallucinogenic. I saw this image of Lord Krishna. So, you know, Krishna in there, in terms of Hindu, is a deity. And I'm not particularly religious. I mean, I've been brought up in a Hindu way. But anyway, this image of Krishna comes and it's so real. It's like he was just standing there. So I was like, this is weird. And I started looking around the ward thinking, can anyone else see him? And literally everyone was sleeping. So I thought, I know I'm hallucinating, but this is weird. And all I heard was, surrender onto me what you cannot control. Now, that didn't mean anything at the time because it's like, this is just weird hallucination stuff. But that's when I started to learn that certain things I needed to let go of because they're not serving me. And surrender onto me meant just trust me, i.e. the universe, the divine, whatever the belief is. And it's then stuff started to make a bit more sense. Don't get me wrong, it didn't happen overnight. In fact, it didn't even happen that year. It was a bit by bit. Then 2013, when I got introduced to my Reiki master at the time, I knew about Reiki. You know, I've, I've been very much into the holistic side of things for quite some time. Really beautiful day. I remember driving to his clinic and thinking, I don't really need this because I'm feeling good today. Well, what I didn't expect was that day was the start of my self-love journey. So if I take you back to this vision of Krishna and those words which are really fundamental to being at one with yourself, being in a state of surrender and how powerful that feels. Have you had any other visions? How's the relationship with your your family and spirit? So it's interesting you actually asked me that. So this year on February 14th, so the anniversary, which marked 31 years, just a few days before that date, it just came to me that my journey with my accident, the loss of my family has come to an end now. Spiritually, in terms of souls, I'm very much about releasing attachments to souls. So for them to fly, I need to release my emotional connection because otherwise I'm just holding them back, you know. But this year on the 14th was the last time I've said, this is the last time I'm going to post about the accident because I'm done feeling sad about it. I'm done feeling sad about the loss of my family. I'm not sad. How can I pretend to be sad when I don't feel sad, society, culture has taught me to be sad, has guided me that it's, oh, what a sad day. What are you going to do to mark it? In actual fact, I refuse to believe grief is a forever thing because I don't feel this. That's not to say they never existed. That's not to say I'm in denial. No, I'm just free. I know why I had to survive because I've come here for my liberation. I've asked for this, you know, I've asked for hardship at a young age. So in the latter life, I can enjoy myself because I feel free. So it's the idea that, you know, and it's, it's very much in that Hindu tradition, but also just in spiritual tradition of the soul choosing the lifetime, choosing the lessons and choosing the family. And it's an extreme story, like you say, but you are testament to coming whole in the, in the incarnation. So like you say, it's like, you've got to this place of total acceptance. Oh, absolutely. And I just feel so grateful. And when you say I'm not, I, I don't want to be the survivor of a plane crash anymore. I'm now more than that. You've really integrated that experience and what an experience to integrate. You know, when we hear about that. It's just a lot of people's greatest fears to be in a plane crash, but also to wake up, to have second, third degree burns and to have lost your close family and walk out of that. Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. When we're all going through some sort of trauma, whatever the trauma, it's an awful feeling at the time. But in hindsight, there's a series of experiences and moments to strengthen us, to build us up. That's the bottom line. No matter what life is going to throw at us, it's never about why me, 
go for it. Try me. I always say, you know, every time something happened, I'd always say, is that all you've got? You know, and it sounds really weird, but really, you're really going to give me that? Okay, cool. Well, whatever next. And I've always asked for whatever next, you know, and I didn't even know I was actually doing that to build more of myself. And the, the quote that I live by, and it, it keeps me going is be the change you wish to see in this world. And I want to be that change that I want to see in this world where we are more empowered beings rather than victim beings. That's what drives me. So here you are still really young. And I know you're in a relationship. You mentioned that you're in a relationship. Is that right? You're in love. Well, yeah, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's there. It's kind of, see, even with the relationship now, it's in my head, it was this magical wonderment being, but even in this relationship, I don't want to be defined in there anymore. Like we're just two souls traveling. He's not defining me and I'm not here defining him. We're just two beings. And that's kind of where we are at. And it's such a nice place. What star sign are you, Tulsi? I'm Cancerian. You're a Cancerian. So you've got got incredible, sort of the medicine of non-attachment is kind of big in you, isn't it? Oh, very much. It's like, it's like that was almost the, the lesson for you. That's the medicine for you is to understand the profound nature of non attachment. Absolutely. And that's been always been a big part of my journey. When I go, I want no trace of me because I'm done, if that makes sense. And so in terms of relationship, I don't want any more attachment add to me. You know, like in a marriage, for example, it's a binding. I don't want that. I want full freedom, liberation in every aspect. So that's why when I talk about him, it's in that context, you know, because I don't want to come back for anything. I just, I'm done. You know, I've healed a thousand lifetimes in this one lifetime. I I don't want any more. I'm blessed in one aspect where I don't have children, husband and all of this because it's easier for me in that respect because I don't have dependence, you know. That's why I'm able to do this because but once upon a time I felt awful because as a woman, why can't I have a child and I want a child. It's what women should be doing. It's so caught up in that. But the reality is I don't want a child because I don't have that energy. I can barely have energy to look after myself, you know, let alone a child. And I know I've come as universal mother because anyone that comes into my realm, I play that role. I play that motherly role. I'm very caring, affectionate, wanting to heal, wanting to cook, you know, all those things like what we would see as a loving mother. But I can hand them back and go, there you go. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, I'm in a really blessed position. So is this the power of positive thought? I guess so. I think it's about practicing what you preach. I think if you practice what you preach, then you're just in your true alignment, right? Because I can't give you advice if I'm not doing it myself because then I'm hypocritical. Everything that I say and do is just because I've done it, not because it's textbook or it's experience it's trial and error so I can't sit here and say self-love is such an easy journey which some people can make it look out as if it is it's like oh yeah buy a bit of rose quartz do a little bit of meditation and yoga and brilliant off we go into the sunset Uh uh-uh it's far from that and I will tell you it's gruesome I will tell you there's times you want to scream and all that and then I'll tell you times when it's euphoric and it's ecstatic you know I'll I'll guide you through those days because I know what it's like, you know. So what crystals are you using today, Tulsi? The only one I have is amber, blue amber. And the weird thing with crystals is I can't actually wear them. So um, my body actually starts rejecting them now. You know, I used to wear necklaces, bracelets. I even make them, but I physically can't work with them. It's just because I don't need anything external anymore to help me with anything if that makes sense because it's all from within that's not to say I don't believe in them because I still have them around me I'm sure you might be able to see some few bits behind me but I just can't physically work with them because the energy is just 
too much for me now. Like it served its purpose. So when I say the words love, purpose, connection to you, what does it feel like? It feels like home. It's like my soul has just got this beautiful hug and it's just, it's cosy. It's that beautiful cup of tea on a cold night by the fireplace. It's that, you know, it's wholesome. It's it's warming. Um, love is the universal language. Everything heals with love, right? Purpose is our sole purpose. Why are we here, you know? And connection is this beautiful, um, invisible thread that connects the whole of us um, collectively, individually. It's like this um, fiber optic, right, broadband type thing. Or in the air, we've got natural Wi-Fi. It was always there, right, Um, which is a Wi-Fi signal to the universe. So all of that encompassed is who we are, is who essentially who we are, who we've, why we are here. So we're all one is what you're trying to say, Tulsi. Basically, yep. (laughs) Today, you sit here and you're like, I'm at one and my soul is free and the karma is done and in love and light, it's all good. Yay! (laughs) Thank you so, so much. Thank you. (laughs) To find out more about Tulsi, you can find her at Tulsi Divine 108. You can also find me at Estelle.Bingham. If you've enjoyed the show, do share it, rate it and review it. This podcast is produced by Sarah Cudden with exec production from Kate Taylor. It's a Feast Collective production. Until the next one, wishing you all more love, purpose and connection. Mm